we have about 60 people coming in at, at this point and we are uh, going to get started so we so that we can move forward. We have an action packed event. Mr. Allen Brown with the South Carolina, uh, yeah, with the South Carolina sent SBDC is uh, available to, to us this evening. And I'm gonna let Alan tell you all about what his organization does. Uh, this is in partnership with the City of Columbia Office of Business Opportunity. And of course we have uh, the Small Business Association, Women, Women's Benedict mm -hmm. College, Women's <clears throat> Business Center, and USC Columbia Technology Incubator. And each week we will highlight the organizations that, um, that are involved. The goal specifically is to create an atmosphere where you can learn the process, process of um, your business plan. Last week was about the concept. It was about finding the value in uh, your business. Does your service provide a assist a need or a desire? This week is about the industry and the market analysis. You need to understand the business uh, environment as well as your competitors. Alan is going to discuss that uh, this morning. He says that his program is about 50 minutes. So we're gonna to try to give him as much time as necessary. From 11 o'clock to 11.30, there will be a question answer section. I will put the link in the uh, chat box as it relates to next Tuesday night. Uh, and we did provide a uh, workbook. We had a discussion as it relates to what, whether it was homework, um, pre-work or coursework, whichever one you decide, uh, it is your, your, your willingness to invest in your business that allows you to have a business plan because it is the roadmap. It is the process uh, of what you have. I know a lot of times we talk about vision boards. Your business plan is your business, your vision board. Uh, Alan, I am going to allow you to take the Zoom podium. And uh, if there are any questions relating to any of the organizations that uh, I have discussed, please feel free to reach out uh, to the chat. Mr. Alan Brown is a excellent tutor and he will provide you with a wealth of information. Mr. Brown, the podium is yours. Thank you, Shelia. Um... First of all, I wanna thank everyone for showing up today. I wanna to thank um, Shelia, the city of Columbia, um, OVO team, uh, Angela with the SBA, Cheryl in her absence with WDC, and Aisha, you know, again with the city team who are um, spearheading this. You know, Kate Stewart, who is uh, a, a building mate of mine here at the incubator. Um, it's good to have her as a part of the collaborative as well. Um, as Shelia has already stated, my name is Alan Brown, and I am the Midlands Coordinator and Business Consultant for the Small Business Development Center um, for the Columbia Area Office here in what we call the Midlands. And that consists of Fairfield County, Lexington County, Kershaw County, and Richland County. Um, sometimes we support small businesses in Sumter and Clarendon County, but those four counties are the counties that, you know, we really focus on. And we have uh, four regions in the state of South Carolina, um, USC, Winthrop, Clemson, and South Carolina State, um, over 21 centers, and we serve all 46 counties and we've been here for close to 50 years. Um, as you can see um, in the bottom right hand corner, 
you know, um, 2020 year end data, we haven't gotten our 2021 data finalized as of yet. You know, uh, we've helped um, retain or create, you know, close to 4,000 jobs in the state of South Carolina, you know, helped over um, 143 businesses get started and um, provided consulting services to close to 12,000 individuals. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate, you know, because that's one of my specialties is the capital formation piece. We were able to help small businesses in the state of South Carolina acquire um, $77 million of capital. And that's a two part thing, that's debt and equity, um, but it's all funding that they utilize to start and grow their businesses. And then through our training events, we help train over 10,000 individuals in the state of South Carolina in 2020. You know, you, you can, if you think back, 2020 was the year that, you know, we started with COVID. And so there was a lot of chaos and volatility in the marketplace during that time. And so people had a lot of questions about what they should do in order to sustain their businesses. And so you can imagine we had a large volume of um, people calling us and contacting us about our services. You know, uh, we have um, three areas where we focus on consulting, education, and resources. And by resources, I mean, we take into account um, establishing relationships with local partners in the marketplace, like the city of Columbia, um, like banks and IT professionals, you know, thinking about it from perspective, that ecosystem that you need from a business owner perspective to help you grow your business. You know, um, we serve four particular markets, you know, uh, prevention, emerging growth and established companies. Um, here in the Columbia office, our focus or our sweet spot um, where we do our best work is really with emerging and growth companies. Um, as far as services, the services that we tend to um, provide most often are on the startup side. Um, with startup um, forming and launching, um, startup funding, and um, as you can imagine, um, market sales and growth assistance. You know, we also um, help small businesses with access to capital and financial analysis. We have a suite of tools that um, we can, um, what we call in the banking world, spread your financials and uh, basically do a health assessment of your company, you know, to help you get a better understanding of what's going on in your company. You know, um, since 2020, you can imagine we've been spending a lot of time in the disaster prep and recovery assistance area. And that's a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last two and a half years. We're st starting to see it come down some in 2022, but we're still working with some clients, working through, um, COVID funding, restarting, and things of that nature, you know, um, and we're probably going to see a resurge in that in the restaurant area as they're making some changes around um, the restaurant revitalization fund. Um, I don't have a lot of information on that to discuss today, but that's an area where we're getting um, rebriefed on because it's something that came about last year and kind of went away and now it's come back again. You know, um, from a disaster prep and COVID perspective, you know, a lot of times, you know, individuals like myself come on different webinars and we talk about the great work that we do, right? Um, but I think the best way to really show the work that we do is to have our clients to speak for us. And so some of you um, may know um, Gabby Bowes, you may know um, Gabby Goodwin and Rosalind Goodwin, who are the founders of um, Gabby Bowles, also known as Confidence now. Um, that's one of my clients. And, you know, I'd just like to share with you um, just some of her comments about the services that she's received at the SBDC. I'm just going to share a portion of the, of the wording there that says, you know, um, um, Alan Brown has always been a good source for guidance, reason, encouragement, and knowledge for our business. And that's basically what we do for all our clients. We're here um, not to manage your business, but to be a soundboard for you, um, um, to help you make better business decisions. 
and help you think through the decisions that you have at the present time that you need to make in order to start, grow, and um, scale your business. You know, so let's get into it. You know, um, our agenda today is as follows. You know, uh, we're going to talk about understanding um, industry versus markets, um, industry analysis, uh, market analysis slash research, and then um, talk about competitive strategy or more so um, competitive positioning in a marketplace based on the analysis and research we've done. You know, um, like Shulia said, you know, um, please use the chat for questions, you know, post your questions in the chat box. Um, we're gonna be monitoring those. I also ask that, you know, if you have a question when you speak, please, you know, show your wonderful face on the screen so we'll know exactly who we're talking to. Uh, um, I would like to know if I meet you on the street that I had an opportunity to share some information with you and I can come up to you and say hello. So please, you know, if, if, if you can, when you're speaking, if you decide to speak, you know, share your screen. And if you wanna share it throughout the presentation, feel free to do that as well. Awesome, awesome. I see Tangie and Wilhelmina uh, taking me up on that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, so let's get started. Right, so quick distinctions. You know, a lot of times, you know, when we talk about marketing or industry, industry analysis, you know, we use the term market and we use the term industry. And for a lot of us in the room, we really don't know the difference, right? You know, um, but simply, I want you to think about, you know, the industry as the sellers in a particular marketplace. Um, the group of people who sell products or sell services to the people who sell a product in a particular market, in a particular group of products. You know, um, think about your competitors, your suppliers, and all your support services for your particular business. You know, you can also think about the supply chain, right, or how you get your service and products from idea to the customer, right? So think about that as the industry. You know, when you think about markets, um, you want to think about the customers. More specifically, you want to think about the people you are targeting for your particular service or product. Right, And it's important that you remember that because we're going to come back to that point um, throughout today's discussion. Right, Think about it from a perspective of markets are people. Right, Markets are people. You know, um, particularly, we need to make that distinction or that connection because it's the people who are giving us the money that we need right, in order to make that transition of value, that transfer of value for us selling our service or product and them acquiring our service or product. So it's that customer, that person that has the money that you need. They're giving you the money. And then in some cases um, where there are businesses that um, are somewhat what we call the middleman, um, where they're not the actual end use of the product, um, like a car dealership, Right, a car dealer um, like Toyota manufacturing, you know, their customers are the Toyota dealers, the Toyota dealerships, right? They sell to the dealership and then the dealership turns around and sell that product to the end user, right? Um, the customer, right? And so understanding that, you know, that business to business or sometimes what we call B2B or that B2C market, gaining an understanding of how you take your services and products to the market, our marketplace is really important, right? Because it's going to determine some of the constraints. And so big picture, um, when we think about what we're going to talk about today, we're going to identify um, competitive industry, talk about the constraints, how you analyze an industry, 
and how you take account of the key competitors, large and small. And then from a target market perspective, from the um, perspective of figuring out who we're going to spend our time having conversations with when we begin to market, um, we're going to conduct some market research, gain an insight and understanding of who the people are that are buying our services, and then formulate a competitive position based on the players that already exist in the marketplace. So who's selling today? Uh, when we think about who's selling today, what we are trying to gain an understanding of is, you know, um, who do we need to know about who's buying our products? Like, what do we need to know about who's buying our products? Um, and we have to know what environment we're operating in and that exists around us. A lot of times, entrepreneurs think what they're doing no one else has done before right Any, anybody ever thought they had um the latest and greatest idea i've never seen this before right and then you go on google and you see there are 12 businesses that's already doing what you're doing right you know whether you knew it or not that's a form of market research you know, it's, it's a, at its simplest nature, at its simplest, you know, form, but that's a form of market research. You know, so what market research and industry analysis helps us to get to is it helps us to get to a validated, feasible business concept or business idea, right? Well, we, we don't want any unfounded, unvalidated ideas or concepts that we move to market with using our precious limited resources, right? We want to make sure that our solution has a significant problem that exists in the marketplace for a specific customer set. So we'll know that they're more likely to purchase what we have to sell, right? And so a lot of times, you know, what we have to communicate with entrepreneurs is that a real opportunity, pay attention here, a real opportunity is the equivalent of a problem plus a solution. I'm gonna say that again, right? A real opportunity is equivalent to a problem plus a solution. A lot of times we develop solutions, but they're not for problems that people are willing to solve. Right, so who wants to buy a product or who wants to create a product that no one wants to buy, right? That's the waste of time, energy, and resources. So when we think about uh, industry analysis, our objective is to figure out some key components or aspects of the industry so that we'll know how to ultimately know how to position ourselves within it. So we want to know the size of the industry, right? We want to know the structure. We want to know the key success factors. And, and we're going to talk about those in a moment. I'm going to give you an example of what those may look like. You know, we want to know the trends. We want to know the constraints and barriers to entry. We want to know what are those things that we're going to have to deal with in this particular field so that when we're establishing our businesses, we're making sure we're taking account in, of the things that are going to affect us and help us to stay in business and the risks associated with our businesses so that we can manage those effectively. One of the ways we do that um, is, is we gather data around our industry. And the government has come up with a phenomenal way of doing that, right? It's really not that simple. It's, I mean, it's really not that phenomenal. It's really simple, right? They just put everybody in a category um, based on the products and services that are sold in that particular segment, right? And so um, pay attention. They don't calculate demand, right? So going back to economics class, they don't calculate supply and demand 
based on the Nate's codes. They just put everybody in the category and they let others calculate supply and demand utilization of businesses and suppliers and vendors in that industry. We're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. Right, but, but the way that they do that, they base the activity in revenues. That's how they come up with the size, right? And sometimes what you'll realize that in a particular um, NAITS code, NAITS stands for North American Industrial Classification System. Um, you'll find that your business may have multiple NAITS codes. You know, in, in a, a simple uh, example that we use is iTunes and iTunes has been around for a long time. So it's something that we should um, all most likely be familiar with. And when Apple was thinking about developing iTunes and they were you know, going through the process of developing and doing research, what we found or what they found that there were two Nates codes, right? And they're, they're listed there on the screen. What we also find is that, you know, for a very um, specific niched businesses, right? Businesses that, you know, come down and really service a small subset of a particular market. They might not have um, reports for, you might not have a Nate's code, right? And those things are forming over time and you know this, this this system has grown over time and it will it will continue to grow you know um so you could go to this website naics.com um to do a search and find your nates code you know um the the nates code that we're going to be dealing with today is associated with bakeries and so um, we're going to get into an example of what the components of a Nates code are associated with, right? And so when we think about a Nates code, you know, um, there's a broad number and there's a narrow number. Now, counterintuitive, the broad number in and of itself is small. It's a two-digit number. And the narrow number right, the five to six digit code um, is the number that gets you more focused detail analysis in a specific subset of an industry, right? Um, when you think about broad data points, right? it helps you to get a broader understanding of an industry and how it operates. It helps you to figure out major players in that industry across a broader geographic location, right? Typically, you know, um, the financial reports we see associated with our NAITS codes are um, spread across the nation. Um, and then when you start to drill down, you start to get to that six, that five or six digit code, you start to get into more niched areas. Um, for example, when we do a search for bakeries, um, Panera Bread is one of those entities that comes up, right? But if you've ever been to Panera Bread, you know um, Panera Bread is more than a bakery, right? They offer drinks and sandwiches and catering and things of that nature, right? So restaurants is a good example to think about how you have these broad opportunities, these broad industry players. But then when you start narrowing down, you get to your local market, you have your local, sometimes what we call mom and pop shops um, that are specifically um, local to the area, but who also compete with the Panera Breads, the Starbucks, and other large um, corporations, right? Uh, the key things that um, you want to pay attention to when you're um, thinking about Nate's code is you want to um, get a grasp on how this information allows you to focus on the key factors of success in the industry um, that you're in, right? It helps you to get a better understanding of the relevant competitors, um, their offerings, and their prices. It helps you to get a benchmark um, in relating 
to pricing. And I, I emphasize that because a lot of times um, we think that we need to be the low cost provider of our products and services in order to get people to buy from us. And playing the low cost game is a definite way to end up out of business. And I see Shelia shaking her head, right? Um, I'm gonna repeat that, playing the low cost game is definitely a way to end up going out of business. And so we wanna make sure as we go through this process and we help you to understand about business planning in general that you gain insight and confidence about your business and what you know about your business so that you can believe that you're adding value in a way that the customer should pay for, right? That you don't underserve, uh, undercut your services or products because you've done the homework, the pre-work, the field work, right? Those, all those terms, whichever one we want to use, you've done the work to figure out where you're positioned in the marketplace and who you should be having conversations with, right? And so one of the ways that we go from broad to narrow um, from a market perspective is we um, pay attention to what's called TAM, SAM, SOM, and TM. And I have those at the bottom of the screen. TAM, SAM, SOM, and TM. And I'm going to um, explain those a little bit later when we get into the market component. But TAM stands for Total Addressable Markets. SAM stands for Serviceable Addressable Market. SOM, S-O-N, stands for Serviceable Obtainable Market. And then a subset of your SOM um, could be your TM, right? We, we, we're familiar with that term, our target market. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, that, that word addressable is switched out for acceptable. Right, but essentially those mean the same thing. So what's important in the industry analysis, right? We here's the things you want to get out of the industry analysis, kind of as a what's important high level, the stage of the industry, um, whether it's emerging, fragmented, or in decline, right? You think about um, videos, you know, a few years ago, right? You know, actual physical DVDs. Right, that you would actually go to the store and purchase or rent. Right, that business was on a decline, so much so to the point that when, if you're from Columbia and you live on the north side of Columbia, when you drive up Park Lane, you don't see Blockbuster sign marquee on the right in front of their building anymore because they're gone, they're going out of business, right? That business went through a period of declination. It's no longer there, right? Because that product was cannibalized through videos on the internet, the ability to download and up upload and download videos on the internet, right? It's important that you understand where your industry is because depending upon its stage, no matter what stage it is, it's in emerging, fragmented, mark, mature, or decline, you can find you know, potential opportunities to leverage your services and products, right? You know, if the industry is going, growing, we want to understand the, the number of competitors, right? If the firms are profitable, and if they are profitable, at what level? Um, we want to gain an understanding of what are new successful firms doing in the industry that's causing them to accelerate and scale or grow fast that we can take advantage of? And we definitely want to understand what's happening in relationship to technology, how technology is changing the industry and um, research and development opportunities so that we don't um, get cannibalized. And so that 10 years from now, we're not experiencing what happened to Blockbuster. Right, so those are the things that we want, we want to gain insight of, right? And as I stated before, going from a broad analysis to a narrow analysis. I'm gonna do a quick check-in before I move to this um, slide. Kate, do we have any questions in the chat yet? 
We do have a question. So Walina asked if there are more than one NAS codes for your industry, do you use all that apply or how do you determine which specific one you should use? So the, the answer to that question is yes, and it depends. So um, really, um, Walina, um, it really depends on who you're going to serve as your customer. Right, and so when we get to the um, the narrow part of our customer segments, of our target markets, really figuring out who are we going to serve, and we do the research around the people that we're selling our products and services to, what we can do is then um, back out or zoom out from them to see if we have enough demand from that customer segment to really include those industry parameters and barriers in the way that we go to market um, for our customers, right? Because imagine, you know, part of your customer segments, you're, you, you have this particular customer segment that uses your services and they might not be your targeted client, but they utilize your product and you get in revenue from them. What you recognize is that, hey, this customer segment, I'm making money from them, but it's really not my target market. And I'm really not making enough money in that area from them to really allocate my resources to focusing on that target market or that customer segment or as we roll that up, right, that, that Nate's code. And so what we'll do is we'll monitor that group over time, right? We'll say, okay, how are they perform? How did they perform last year? Let's take a look. How did, how did they perform this year? Okay. They, they stayed the same. Oh, okay. Well, are things changing in that particular industry that I may be able to explore and expand my market share in that particular area, right? So it really depends on your goals and objectives and how you want to serve a particular customer base, right? Because we got limited resources and we got limited time. And so it's really going through that process of figuring out what's important to you as an entrepreneur and a business owner and how you want to grow and scale your, your company. Like one of the things that we talked about last week is having systems in place right? And, and we talked about financial systems, HR systems, and things of that nature. Well, in order to make that decision, you really have to have a system in place that's connecting that data, right? And Shelia is going to talk about, right, some of the things you need to do in order to collect that data that helps you to understand what's happening in your business so that you can effectively manage it, right? You can get it within your arms, you can control it. It's not growing beyond you. Um, okay. Did that make sense? <laughs> kind of, sort of. But I'm coming from a grant writer's perspective. And so some applications ask for that code. And my question um, was relative to which one of these codes should I use? How do you determine which one you should use, et cetera? So, or if you use one in that category, um, I guess based on the funding opportunity, I mean, do you have the choice to pick and choose yourself? Okay. And would you be wrong if you pick one of them in that category? That's where I'm coming from with that. So, um, so, so grant writing is not my expertise. Okay. Um, we might have um, some members on the team who've done some grant writing. Okay, then no um, problem. But, but, no. but I will right. say this, you know, in relationship to general um, um, focus on your customer, right? That's um, fine. You want to do what's important and what's relevant to your customer, right? And so, for instance, if the grant is associated with, um, I'm gonna go back for a moment, right? So if the grant um, hypothetically is associated around electronic shopping, okay, right? 
then we wouldn't spend a whole lot of time talking about pre-recorded tapes and CDs, right? We might put a statement, a small sentence in there, but remembering that all of this information is to address the issue that our target audience, our target market has. Okay, that's fine. So when when we're writing anything, we want to make sure that it has the context of the people that we're communicating with. All right, thank you. So that's a general way, but you know, um, we may be able to get you some more specific answers in relationship to grant writing as we go through the process. So make sure you put that in the chat the way that you formulated, Wilhelmina, so we can make sure we get that information back to you. Alan, this is Angela. May I interject real quick? Oh, for sure. Hi, this is Angela with SBA. And most time when, you, when you're looking at grants, the grants is going to tell you what next code they're looking for, the industry that they're looking in. But okay. when you go in SAM, so if you're registered in SAM system for award management, you can put 101 NAICS code in it because most time when you do a federal grant, you're mm-hmm. going to have to be registered in SAM. They want to verify right. that you have that NAICS code in your pool of NAICS code. But when you're doing a specific grant, you just look, make sure the NAICS code that they're asking for is in SAM that relates to that particular grant. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Th- thank you, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Right, so one of the things um, that we talked about um, earlier in the presentation, we talked about success factors, right? So um, the reason we want to get uh, Nate's code, right, is because when we do our, when we're doing our industry analysis and research, you know, there are companies like Ibis World, right, that provides data um, specifically related to the Nate's codes that we can pull and provide that information for you to help you identify what are the keys to success in that particular industry, right? In this particular industry, uh, we're looking at um, NACE code 31181. That's the five-digit code. The two-digit code is 31. And it says manufacturing, but what it's really focused on is food products, right? So it's food products manufacturing right that's a fancy way of saying a commercial baker <laughs> right and so you have to understand what are the keywords associated um, with your business so that when you're doing research you know how to um, do good research right going back to high school when we had to do those research papers and they started telling us about bullying and all those different areas to do research Right. What I suggest is that as you're, you know, um, doing this, that you keep a little notebook, that you're keeping um, your questions and assumptions in, and you're keeping your key data points like the keywords that you're using to search, so that you'll always have that, and you can go back to the information um, th- at some point in the future. Uh, for this particular industry, and and I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit because we're about 40 minutes in. Um, you know, this particular um, industry, one of the two things I really want to point out is that um, supply contracts in place um, for key inputs are essential uh, and the ability to pass on costs are essential. Actually, I'm going to do three um, and I'm going to come back to proximity to key marketplace. Right. And so ability to pass on cost increases. Can anybody tell me what's happening currently in the marketplace um, that could be negatively affecting a business if they don't have ways to pass on those uh, unexpected cost increases to their customers? Anybody want to put in a chat or share with the group via unmuting your mic? It's something we all are experiencing. Hello, everyone. This is Shannon Hammonds. Um, I am in transportation. I am a truck driver at this present time. I am working towards uh, entering the uh, industry in the low barrier of dispatching. And so in our industry right now, uh, we're shortage of drivers, um, shortage of trucks which is detrimental to the, you know, uh, to the 
economy, you know, with getting uh, food and things of those sorts to different, you know, states that right, we need right. to the stores. So, um, so that's where I'm at. So Shannon, let me ask you a question. Yes. Is there a particular commodity that's increased um, over the last four to five months that's made it more challenging for you to operate your business? Um, I'm just really getting started. Okay. I haven't even, yes, gotten a, and yes, she did put, uh, well, the commodity, when I, when you say commodity, I'm thinking about uh, the cargo that's being carried, correct? Or are you well, just how, talking about things like fuel? Fuel, yes, fuel, right? Fuel prices, right? And so, yes. so someone in your industry where, where um, you use large volumes of fuel, in order to provide your services, right? You need to have components in your agreements um, that help you to capture revenue or um, revenue back to your business as there are fluctuations in fuel prices. Um, and one of the ways that I know that transportation companies do that is, you know, through fuel surcharges. Yes. Right. You know. Um, Imagine agreeing to a load two weeks ago, and the, and when you agreed to it, you priced it based on a fuel cost that was two dollars, right? I'm doing the I'm doing the small level, not the not the trucking level, right? Because I don't know what those prices are. But you you do it at, you did it at two forty eight, and then you go to the gas pump um, when it's time for you to make that delivery, and fuels double that. Right, your margin has officially gone away. Yeah. Right, and so that's so that's you know part of the reasons why we, you know, take an um, uh, 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 industry research report and do industry analysis because we want to know those constraints that exist in a particular market, um, in the industry that we are operating in, so we'll know how to negotiate um, for the correct pricing to maintain profitability. Right. Okay. And then proximity to key marketplace, right? In relationship to a bakery, right? You want your bakery to be close to the end user, right? Uh, you you don't want um, your end user to get stale bread or stale muffins, uh, right? So being close to the end user is extremely important in this particular industry. And, and this is the type of information that doing a Nate's Code research can help you to get insight of because it'll help you figure out where to locate your business. Make sense? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. So now from sellers to buyers, right? We, we, you got to, yes. We did have another question and I think it relates to what we just talked about and not going to relate to this. So I figured we would go ahead and address it. Okay. Go ahead. So P. Coleman asked, is there a best practice around the amount of debt a business should carry, or is there a debt slash receivables ratio that should be observed when pursuing funding? Yes and yes, <laughs> right? And, and I'm going to show you a tool, P. Coleman, um, later on at the uh, when we get to resources that will help you understand those things. Man, Shelia's loving this because you asking some, some good questions around financing, right? You asking about ratios and, and debt coverage and things of that nature, financial leverage. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So from so from sellers to buyers, right? So now we need to think about who we're going to sell our products and services to, right? Be we want to really begin to think about who those potential customers are and who the potential competition is, right? We want to think about what are the questions that we need to ask to better understand who we're going to serve, right? You know, oftentimes we hear that entrepreneurs are risk averse, right? Um, um, they're risk averse, meaning they don't like risk. And then we also hear say, the entrepreneurs are risk, are risk takers, right? Really what we're trying to communicate in both of those statements 
is that we should take calculated risks as entrepreneurs, meaning we should measure the potential gain, the potential reward, right, and the potential loss and determine based on our own risk profile, our own stomach, our ability to lose what we have, right, to see if this particular option that we have in front of us is for us, right? Because really when it comes to market analysis, what we're talking about is discovering a customer, right? Discovering a customer, right? And when we talk about discovering a customer, we wanna know the size and growth rate. We wanna know their problems and pains. We wanna know what products and services that they may be using to do what our product and service do that might not be a good fit. You know, who, who's ever used a shoe as a hammer? <laughs> right? <laughs> that was an alternative product to the hammer, right? It, it, it may have got the job done poorly, right? <laughs> but it was an alternative product, right? Lowe's and Home Depot were like, dude, you can come get this really nice hammer that'll get that job done quicker and faster, more efficient, right? And then you won't have potential holes in the heels of your shoes, right? So when we talk about alternative products and services, those are the things that we're talking about. And then really understanding trends and um, really focusing on potential entry points to serve that particular customer base, all right? And so there are five steps that I want you to think about when you're considering your customer, how you discover your customer, right? We really wanna gain insight and understanding of their pain points. Uh, we wanna develop customer personas. And Wilhelmina, this goes back to what we were talking about in relationship to the grant writing. We want to understand the organization that we're sending the grant to, that we're, that we're applying for the grant. What's their missions, right? What's their vision? What their objectives are, right? You know, that's profiling the client and, and developing profiles, right? And then if we can, we want to interview similar customers in the marketplace, right? To get some firsthand insight, right? To do some primary research around what they're really expecting. Remember we said the last thing we wanna do is to create a product or service that no one wants to buy, right? And by doing some interviews and some um, testing, some user experience testing, we can discover some insights about the customer needs that we didn't even have, right? Because we're coming from our perspective and we're coming from our one person limited perspective around the service and product, when we take it to the marketplace, when we wanna back up and say, hey, what's the problem that you're having, right? You know, I, I think about it in, in this way, is I think about it in, in connected to an acronym um, that I use called PINTS, P-I-N-T-S, problems, issues, needs, trends, and situations, right? What, what, what are those things related to a particular customer, right? Because part of the discovery is trying to find not just how painful the problem is, but also whether it's a big enough problem across enough constituents or customers, right? To make it worth building a product or service and building a company, right? Because we don't want to sell one muffin we want to sell ten thousand, right and then understanding the customer's um journey to our product how they learn about our product how they interface with our product and eventually what causes them what's that trigger that causes them to say yes i want your product and so the key questions are getting to the point where we're very precisely trying to figure out who's going to buy our product who's going to purchase our services. We want to know precisely, right? And so oftentimes, you know, uh, we'll, we'll hear people 
Um, when you ask them, you say, well, who's your customer? And they'll say, everybody. Everybody ain't your customer. How are you going to service everybody? I mean, you think of some of the largest businesses um, in, in the world, Apple. Everybody's not Apple's customer, right? You know, um, there are some Android users and that if you purchase an Apple phone from them, they'll take that shoe that we was using as a hammer and smash it. Don't give me no Apple products, right? So we want to take that misnomer out of the fact that everybody is your customer. Everybody is not your customer, right? What we want to move to is we want to figure out, right? And look at that graphic that I have on the screen, right? We want to, we want to move to a broader focus where we're taking a look at the total addressable market, the potential market. Now, you notice, I'm going to back up for a moment. You notice that we went from everybody to a specific part of the globe, right? Think about going from everybody to the US, right? TAM is representing everybody in the US, potential customers, right? These are potential customers, right? And then we move to available or addressable. Yeah, these are people that could potentially buy your product, right? But here's the group that you really have an opportunity to reach, right? Here are the ones that you really have an opportunity to get them to your website, right? To communicate with them through various social media platforms. Here's the ones that you really have an opportunity to reach. But guess what? Here's the ones that are really in your marketplace that are more likely to purchase from you. Right, this would be your regional area. For some of us, this might be South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, and for others, it might just be the Midlands area. Right, it's depending upon your industry and um, your market and your services and your products. But here's the here's the big one, right? Here's the one that you specifically speak to because. In your market, your marketing, and that's something Kate is going to talk to us about in two weeks, is really resonating and pointed to this specific group of customers. And what we like to do is we like to have you to think about it from um, a persona, an avatar, an ideal client perspective, where you take psychographics and demographics and um, geography into account to think about what's important to them and what are their buying patterns. Here are some examples of the types of, you know, um, ideal customers, avatar and buyer personas that you should be developing, right? So everything that I've talked about previously leads up to this, right? After you've done all of that analysis and research, we're distilling that information so that we can formulate this type of profile to address a particular customer so that when you do your elevator pitch, like I do mine, when I say I help entrepreneurs connect to capital and opportunities in ways that increase revenues and cash flows, they say, oh, Alan, tell me more about that. And I'm like, I'm so glad you asked, right? Because what I've done is I've realized that the keywords I'm using in my elevator pitch are resonate with this particular client. And here's another example, right? You know, looking at her frustrations, right? And then another example, um, taking into account, you know, Clark's goals and frustrations. You know, um, Clark's frustrations um, are key, but what's important to us as a bakery is that Clark wants to cut down unhealthy eating and drinking habits, right? So if we know Clark wants to cut down on unhealthy drinking and eating habits, we can say, Clark, we got some healthy muffins over at our bakery, right? And we start advertising those. We um, putting coupons in, in Clark's social media feed, right? 
So he's learning more about us. Look, I don't, I don't think there's anybody on the planet that does that better than Starbucks, right? I get my points and I'm like, oof, I need to go by Starbucks. Starbucks wasn't even on my mind until I got that push notification that I got unused points that if I don't spend, they're going to be gone by tomorrow, <laughs> right? And so it's doing those types of things that helps us to connect with our, our, our marketplace, our customers, so that um, we can increase our revenue and sales and do it in a way that's profitable, right? So it's imperative that you do these particular things, right? Because at the end of the day, research is intended to let you know more about your customers, their wants, their behaviors, and key part, their ability to pay, right? So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of these, right? Because we're going to provide these slides to you um, as a follow-up um, to the presentation. So when you get a moment, when you get them, just go in and read those components that um, are listed here that I didn't read. You know, uh, I will say that, you know, your business and industry type will affect your research methods. Going back to that question that Wilhelmina asked. Wilhelmina, thank you for asking that question because it's something that, you know, I'm sure a lot of your peers had in mind. Um, Shannon, I think that was you that shared about your business enterprise and where you are, right? Because those make the conversation points that we we're talking about relevant. And then when we thinking about market research, right? Part of the components is when we're looking at business data, um, we're looking at the competition, right? We're looking at the customer and stats and all this information. What we're really trying to do is three things. We're trying to get secondary market research. That's the market research that somebody has provided for you. Um, we, we really want some primary market research that's where you specifically has talk, have talked to a customer, right? And, and some test marketing, right? One of the ways that we um, experience or engage with test marketing today is people say, hey, remember when Zoom first came out? You know, um, they had this free platform, right? Oh, everybody could get on Zoom, right? It didn't cost you nothing to get on Zoom, right? And they get you used to clicking that button, Zoom, and today they've changed the flat platform that now it costs you to do some of the things that you used to do for free, right? And where you used to have unlimited people for, for 45 minutes and they wouldn't say nothing. Now you got three people and they say, oh, your time is about to come to an end. And if you don't, and if you don't do something, the next thing you know, you'll be sending out another link to get people back into the conversation. Right, that's ways of test marketing, right? Getting people um, and demoing, getting people used to using your product in a manner that's safe for them and then making those adjustments to see how they use it based on how they use it and then say, oh, well, yeah, we're gonna charge you for this, we're gonna charge you for that, right? To increase your revenue. And then one of the final components in relationship to this side is this three things, right? When you think about it, is you want to segment your client base, you want to target them so that you can position your business in the marketplace related to specific competitors, right? And there are three types of competitors, the direct, indirect, and future, right? You know, um, for IBM 30, 40 years ago, right? Um, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were those future competitors that was in their garage creating Microsoft and Apple that was coming to eat their lunch in particular consumer products that they had developed but really wasn't taken to the marketplace, right? So don't sleep on future competitors, right? That's one of the reasons why we don't have Blockbuster with us anymore because they slept on future competitors, right? But going back to direct and indirect, right? Direct competitors are those, those businesses that do exactly what you do, right? They're identical, similar products. Right, indirect, or they do sort of kind of what you do, right? In in our example today, we use Panera as an indirect competitor for a bakery, right? Starbucks would be an indirect competitor because they have bakery goods. And guess who even getting into the bakery good business? 
McDonald's with M Cafe, right? They got them apple fritters. Y'all can tell I like sweets, right? <laughs> they got them apple fritters. I have to say no, no, Alan, no, no. You got to keep your blood sugar down, right? No, 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 right? But those are the type of things that you want to think about in relationship to competition. And then you want to do what we call a competitive matrix where you, based on the things that you found to be relevant, important, and important for your customers, you compare your business with specifically your direct competitors and a few of your um, indirect competitors that are, that are in your marketplace or in proximity to your business that your customers have a potential to utilize um, as an alternative to your solutions, right? You wanna rank, you wanna um, do a competitive matrix. Now, the key thing about this is that when this is all done, you should rank higher than your competitors. If you don't, that means you need to tweak your offering around the points that are important to them until you see how you can rank higher compared to these particular competitors based on what you're doing, not what they're doing, based on what you're doing. And now you have the foundation for a great marketing plan because now you know how to speak to your customers in a way that resonates with them, right? Um, I'm going to briefly just share with you this one resource and how you hold on, and how you can go utilize it. Um, I'm a Show it to you. Let me see. Give me a minute. I'm going to pull it up. Right. Stop sharing for a moment. And I'm going to, well, actually, I'm going to continue to share uh, screen one. I'm just going to move this over. All right. So, so do you guys see a uh, uh, need big data for your small to mid-sized company on the screen, right? And so, so this website is included in the slide, right? But one of the things that um, is key about this particular website is that um, the amount of data that it gives you in relationship to um, your particular industry. Right, and so I just created a company um, that did a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, and and based on this tool, we can see very easily that compared to this initial queue, that they're very small compared to other competitors in the marketplace, right? Because average business revenue for them is just a hundred thousand, and for others, it's over a million, right? But but that means we need to do a little bit of digging, right? Because who, who are we looking at when we really take a look at those competitors? Oh, we got some indirect competitors. And we got Food Line and Panera Bread. We got Walmart Bakery, right? We got Lowe's Foods who offer bakery items, right? And so this is part of the reason, right? We do that research to get a better understanding of our local market. This tool, which is um, Size Up SC, is a really good tool to help you understand what's happening in your local market, right? And so that website is listed here. And you, again, you're going to get these slides, and so you know um, you'll have an opportunity to um, utilize these slides um, and take advantage of the resources that are listed there. Right. Um, at the end of the day, remember, it's all about the customers, right? Solving their pain, um, solving their point and their pain points and figuring out which ones you want to solve. And then you know, analyzing the industry, analyzing the market, you know, taking the key factors of success into account and then um, coming up with a competitive strategy based on your competitive position 
um, that in, that leverages the value that you bring to the marketplace. Um, um, we're at an hour and five minutes. It's uh, 11 or eight. We have some time left for questions and discussion. Um, Kate, are there some questions or discussion points in the chat that we want to go through? There's no new questions yet, but awesome. okay. definitely feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute and ask Ellen all of your questions. Hi, this is Walena. I did type something. I think I sent it directly to someone. I'm sorry. Um, when, when we do a search on this site, do we type in the name of the industry or the code? Either, so either or. Okay. Either or. Um, um, it's, it's, you know, because sometimes we know our code. Uh huh. Right. And sometimes we don't. And when we don't know our code, Okay. Um, using keywords to describe our business. Right. And that's and that's really a good question. Okay. Um, Walina, because oftentimes we describe our business different from the way others describe it. Right. Right. And so we can be talking about the same thing and calling it something different, and True. we're having a disconnect. So the inherent value that we may provide to one another is being lost because our communication was off. Right. Right. I remember when we first started, she was going to be mad at me. Uh, when we first started um, planning this, I was calling Shelia, she, she, Sheila. And that's not her name. <laughs> right. And so our, and so our communication was off. Because she was like, this guy can't read. <laughs> he he don't know what's going on. And you know, and she is the type of person she's like, okay, Alan, I'm gonna give you one more chance to get my name right. And now and I say that because I'm particular about my name also, right? Because people spell um their names. There are people who don't spell the name Alan the way that God intended. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? So when, people, okay. so when people say, how do you spell your name, Alan? I say the way God intended. <laughs> right? But it's that communication, right? So that's a great question, right? Gaining an understanding of how we classify and call things is really, really important because it helps us to, you know, as they say, get on the same page. Absolutely. Right, right, and my right. name is Walina. Walina. Thank you. <laughs> Walina. Yes, thank you. So, so there was a, another question and we can get to that uh, yet. But one of the things that I've just wanted to bring up before you start on your mission and your vision, you come up with a concept and you may want to do the uh, market market analysis. Mm -hmm. that will allow you to understand the value that you add. And then that in itself can create the mission and the vision, which allows you to walk through the process. So a lot of times we may start off with a mission and a vision, but we haven't did our research right. and recognize that that is, and I, I love what he said with that is a, that's, it's a problem, but it's a problem no one wants to solve. But making sure that you understand what your client wants to solve uh, is, is critical when you are establishing your mission and your vision as well. Kate, do we have another question? Yes, we have Shannon with her hand raised and we have Elena in the chat. I will say Elena's real quick and then we can get to Shannon. So Elena asked, also, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong because I'm from Alabama and I say lots of people's names wrong. Um, but <laughs> what's the best strategy if you are working backwards for a business? So it's an established business with a clientele, but it's missed some steps along the way that would make it more viable and successful. So what's your best strategy for moving forward? So that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked it because um, it's really only relevant if you have customers, you know, so there's a concept um, that I call acres of diamonds. And basically the story behind acres of diamonds is that, 
you know, um, there, you know, a guy was a farmer. Um, he had somebody tell him about these diamond mines and how people were getting rich um, on these diamond mines. And so he sold his farm to go purchase a diamond mine. And the person who purchased his farm was walking by a stream on the farm on a particular day and saw something shining in the water. Um, lo and behold, he went and picked it up and he found that it was a diamond, right? And unbeknown to the previous owner, he already had, catch the phrase here, acres of diamonds in his possession that he let go because he was looking for something else elsewhere, right? When you have a customer base, right? And you've um, um, been able to, um, get people to buy from you. You were able to hoodwink them, twist their arm, right? Um, through your marketing, something. You got them to buy from you, right? You should have some data that tells you who they are, right? And so mining your current book of business, right? To figure out who are your, right? Going back to that segmenting, who are your top purchasers of your goods and services? Right, figuring out why they buy, what they buy, when they buy, and profiling them, right, and then using them to find more people like them, right? You're ahead of the game because you already have something to work with. We call that primary research because you have that data yourself. Um, it is right there sitting right in your business that you can take advantage of, right? There, you know, we, you know, um, we have resources here at the, at the Small Business Development Center. The WBC has resources that they can help you, you know, gain some insight and leverage those resources to better help you understand who your customers are, right? You know, but think about that, that story, acres of diamonds. Oftentimes we leave what we have in order to get something that we don't want. Right, and we often don't find out that we don't want it until we got it. Right. And I, I want to I want to piggyback on that as well. It's never too late to go back to the drawing board. And when I say go back to the drawing board, I don't necessarily mean go back to the drawing board as it relates to uh, to your concept, but to go back to the drawing board and create a business plan. If you have already, if you have an existing business, then just put that information, write it down and create, follow the same process. Right. The other thing that is important about a business plan is it is a living document, meaning that you don't write a business plan today, put it in a drawer and don't look at it for until you have to ask for more financing because as your business grows, as the market continue to evolve and change, your plans uh, will change as well. One of the things that I think about all the time, March 18, 2020 is when the world shut down. Every business plan that did not incorporate some type of e-commerce or some type of virtuality had a, a plan that was non-existent. Every business had to go back, regardless of whether it was Delta Airlines or, uh, Kiki's Chicken and Waffles, or uh, I don't know, the lemonade stand. Everyone had to go back and restructure that plan to include additional safety of scenarios involved, to include uh, additional contingency plans, to uh, include nobody thought about Zoom. Now nobody wants to drive anywhere to a meeting because we can do it on Zoom. So you have your plan has to continue to evolve based on the growth of your business based on whether that cash cow has turned into a dog, meaning that it's not making any more money now, and, and as well as uh, all of the things that are involved. The, the, the last comment I will make as we were talking about uh, marketing is understanding the barrier it is to get into that market. I.e., if you want to, let's say, start a cable company, that's going to be difficult because most of that market has been saturated with Spectrum or, or whomever, but it's very difficult 
uh, to get in that business. On the other hand, there are other businesses that there are low barriers to, to get in. So in addition to understanding the market, understand what is it going to take? What licenses do I need to have? What educational background do I need to have? How much money do I need to have? And if I want to get in that business, is it something that, uh, is it something that are there barriers that would prevent me from, from getting into that business? We can take a, a few more questions. Thank Go you, ahead, Shannon. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I know we have a lot of resources, um, but I was wondering about a mentor, if, if we're able to, you know, I guess have a mentor to kind of help walk us through this. You know, I'm, I'm very passionate in the industry that I am, I'm in, very passionate, and I'm enjoying the process, um, um, but it, it could be overwhelming. And I'm just wondering, and I know there's a lot of resources uh that's helpful to us but um are we able to get a mentor to kind of help us on this journey so, so the uh, women's the women's visiting college is one as what a business center is one i know that alan's uh process is another so you can reach out to the partners the other thing too is over if you guys just subscribe on my website over the next couple of months i wanted to design a a once a month lunch and learn where for those of us who are going through this process, we can have you know piggyback off off of each off of each other. So if you would just you know go into my website and subscribe there, uh, as we get through this process, uh, we can do that as well. Score so has in, one, mentor yeah, so SC whole, so has one as well. So in response to that comment, you know, so you know, um, as Celia mentioned, um, the WBC. Um, which is the Women's Business Center, uh, the Small Business Development Centers, as I share our locations at the beginning of the session, are uh, located all across the state. Um, and then you have SCORE um, as right. well, right? And so all of those organizations are resource partners for one of the major promoters of the day's um, meeting, which is the SBA. You know, Angela Brewer here is representing them, right? Those services are free to you. And they have counselors, advisors, mentors, right? They don't, they don't always use the same term, um, Shannon and everyone else on the call, but those services are free to you. You don't have to pay. It's no cost to you because you've already paid for those services via your tax base, right? Do, via your tax. And so the, the answer to your question is yes, there are free services for you. Now, you know, um, uh, long term, depending upon how you grow your business. Right, there are other resource partners that we that I, I mentioned earlier, like Shelia, that you definitely want to have as a part of your team, right? Because we don't get into the deep weeds. None of those resource partners get into the deep weeds of your accounting, right? You need someone like Shelia to help you develop your chart of accounts, to help you understand um, the implications of those things, right? You need, you know, what we call a Bell IT team. You need a banker, attorney, um, a banker, an accountant, an insurance person, a lawyer, and as Sheila, you mentioned, right, you can't succeed in this marketplace without having um, some type of IT or technology component to your business. And, and because of that, you need someone to support you in that area as well. All right, uh, are there any additional questions? So I want us to make sure that we, uh, Respect everyone's time. We've got about nine minutes. Uh, number the first thing is you will receive a copy and a link to this uh, recording. Uh, number two, we will have a uh, co session on Tuesday evening, and the, the link with it will be provided as well. We're not recording the the Tuesday evenings because it's more of a collaboration and I want everyone to feel comfortable about uh, th those questions. Next week, next week, next week, we have talked about the concept, we've talked about the industry, now we need to talk about 
the finance piece? And that was a great question as it relates to uh, your debt ratio. We're going to start with that concept. How do we uh, walk through the process of making sure that we understand what it is to start a business? Uh, number two, how we're going to finance that startup. And then the uh, third part of that process is to know how to project out as it relates to that. This is going to be really important because as uh, Alan did say, there is so much that's going on, job, the labor costs, inflation, uh, all of that plays a role in the accounting uh, piece today. I really want to thank Kate. Kate Allen, uh, Kate was with the USC Columbia Technology Incubator. Allen has been representing South Carolina uh, Business Development Center. Uh, Aisha Drigger has, is with the Columbia Office of Business Opportunity. Cheryl is not with us today, but she uh, represents the Women, Women's Business Center uh, the, I'm sorry, Benedict College Women's Venters Business Center. Say that three times really, really fast. Uh, and this is a, a goal that we want to continue to provide you with information that you can um, that you can utilize as it relates to, to your business. We have a lot of ongoing sessions. I know the Women's Business Center uh, does as well. Um, you want to register to the City of Columbia Office of Business Opportunity. They, they also provide a events letter. Uh, if any of my partners want to speak and close us out, that would be wonderful. Um, as a presenter for the day, I would just like to say thank you everyone for taking the time out of your schedule to attend our session today. I hope I added some value um, and, and caused you to think about some things you possibly hadn't thought about in relationship to your business. I do want to um, thank everyone who participated um, today, you know, um, either via um, verbally sharing and asking questions, you know, verbally and in the chat. And I know there are some comments in the chat that we didn't get to, um, but we do appreciate all of you who posted in the chat about inflation and um, diesel fuel costs going up and those things that we didn't get to for the interest of time, but were relevant to the conversation and that everyone can take a look at again um, when we send the um, chat group out. Kate did point out in the chat that um, the specific things that we're going to send out, I'm gonna pass it to Kate. And so she can remind us of those things that are gonna come out come that going to come out and then I, I think that might be it for the end. Yeah, of course. So the first main reminder is make sure that you register for next week when we're going to talk about financing and all fun things with Celia. And then the last week where me and Aisha will be covering marketing and your executive summary and all that really fun, awesome stuff to get your customers to buy, buy, buy but do it in a way that comes off as informative and helpful instead of being the salesperson that you see in those annoying commercials there that the music gets stuck in your head. Um, so we're going to talk about new kind of innovative digital ways to talk about that. The email that you're going to receive is going to have the presentation for today. It's going to have the meeting chat for today. It's going to have a survey for you to let us know what you liked, what you hated, what you hope to see from us and our awesome partners in the future. It will also have the Zoom link information and also the dates and times for those upcoming Tuesday sessions that are meant for us to get a little deeper in our networking and also a little deeper into some like one-on-one -on -one Q and A. Um, and then once it is live, you'll also get a YouTube link moving forward about the recording of this week's session and last week's session is already on YouTube. Um, but the best resource is going to be a meeting chat. If anyone would like to drop their contact information to have in the meeting chat for anyone else to network or reach out to, feel free to do so. But we're so glad you are all able to attend today and we can't wait to see y'all next Thursday. If you have any questions, please let us know and have a great rest of your week and weekend. Good that, good. Happy Easter. Oh, one other thing. Taxes are due Monday, April the 18th. Forgot to tell you. 
If you have not filed, please file an extension. Guys, it's 11.27, so I'm going to give you three whole minutes back to your desk. Good night. Goodbye. Thank you.